Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are with Candice Rasa for another Soul Seeker podcast. This has got to be at least her fifth, sixth appearance. I'm not sure. It's hard to keep track at this point, but Candice, I am so stoked to speak with you and excited of the same meaning there. That's just how excited I am. I can't get my words out. So for that, I need to ground with some breath. So this is selfishly for me but I know it's going to help you too, Candice, and every Perfect. single one of you guys listening as well. So as always, don't close your eyes if you're driving or anything like that. Always be mindful of your own safety. If you can close your eyes, I invite you to start to slow down, find a comfortable seat, and just gently shifting from the outer world, the chaos, the busyness of the outer world, and into our inner world, feeling our feet on the floor, Palms on the lap and through the nose, taking a conscious and intentional inhale and bringing that breath all the way up. And through the mouth, sighing it out. Slowly inhaling through the nose, letting the belly expand and bringing that breath all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath, rolling up the eyes towards the third eye space, maybe applying a root lock, and sighing it out, letting it go, let it go, let it go. Slow inhale all the way up through the nose, sipping in a bit more air at the top, sipping a bit more, roll up the eyes, hold the breath, apply that root lock, and just feeling. And exhale, let it go, let it out, let it out. And the eyes flicker open, letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm. And here we are. All things Candice and Akashic Records and government and influence and sovereignty. So much. Candice, welcome back to the show. Thank you. That was delicious. I feel super grounded and open in my channel. So I'm excited to bear witness to what we discussed today. Yeah, I didn't even have to ask you one to two words on how you're feeling. We got it. Delicious. I love it. Yes. Let's dive in. So for anyone that isn't familiar with Candice, check out the show notes and look at the other podcasts we've done. Literally, she's been a guest on this podcast for probably about four or five years now. It's been a while, it's a yearly update or something like that. So if you're new to the Akashic Records, the Akashic Records is like the library of the soul. We're not going to get into what it's all about. Time doesn't exist. You have multiple lives. You can learn more about those lives that are really parallel lives through working with someone like Candice or the Akashic Records. With that, Candice, just a quick little update. Like, What have you been up to in the past year? Specifically, like, let's talk about the research project, but just in general, like, stage is yours would love to hear what's been going on in your world yeah thank you so i've been in a real building and 
executing season of my life and in my business for those who may follow my work. And I'm really excited to share and Sam knows about it is I'm participating, creating um, the first ever formal research on Akashic records and mental health. So what we're trying to prove in essence is that Akashic sessions impact mental health symptoms favorably, things like anxiety, stress, um, resilience, and connectedness. So how that works is we invite folks to be part of our study and they do two Akashic sessions. And in between those sessions, they fill out like formal evidence-based mental health assessment scales. So people will be completing scales on depression, anxiety, and stress resiliency and connectedness. And all these scales are evidence-based and used in the mental health world. And we're like plucking them out of there and plopping them into our work. And so the hope of course, is to um, notice how people's mood shifts or improves or increases in resiliency um, through Akashic sessions. We also have like a qualitative element, which is people will meet with my counterpart, also licensed therapist at the end of the research and do an interview with her. And everyone's going to get asked the same six questions. And we're going to uh, look at that. And our goal with all of this is to like use our bows to like elbow our way into the world of academia and to take work like this, that um, I think is obviously transformative and talk about it with other upcoming therapists, which will allow us to then publish the research um, and speak at conferences. So that's kind of our goal is to be a staircase. Cause when we did our own research, not like nothing exists like this around channeling um, and mental health. So we're super excited to be the first to do it, which then is a benchmark for everybody that comes after us. I, I love this. And it's been so cool following your journey for the past year and a half or so to see it yeah. all coming to life. And you had a speaking engagement, I think last fall. And could you yes. tell us a little bit about that and how that was the first time of uh, so, what it was and breaking that barrier? Yeah. yeah. So I've been a, a, a speaker for several years in a row at the Florida State Conference for National Social Association of Social Workers, and I'm a licensed social worker. And I think because they know me and I talk about Buddhism and it's typically well attended, they were they gave me a little bit of room this year because when I applied to talk this year, it was not about Buddhism. It was about Akashic research. So I was so pleased that they said yes to my proposal. Um, and really, we went in there without any data because the research had not yet started and we're actually in progress right now. And our goal is a hundred people. So I'm not sure when your listeners hear if they're like, oh, I want to do that. You know, they can head on over to my website and learn more, whether it's still going on. If we're still accepting applicants, there is a 15% discount on both sessions if you're part of the research. But when we went to the conference, we actually went there to talk about channeling as a clinical modality at a state academic conference, which is like, before I went down to do my talk, I was like, am I nuts? Like, am I? what am I doing? Right. It was like so much, like all of my past life karma of probably being burned at the stake. It was all kind of coming mm -hmm. up like, wow, like what a full circle moment for me to be bringing this into this world. And honestly, it was the best um, possible scenario. We were so well received. We had over 60 social workers attend. People were really open to it. And I sort of started it off really direct. I was like, hey, what you're about to hear today, we've never talked about, no one's ever talked about, and it's going to involve channeling. Mm -hmm. And if that, and if that's like way outside of your comfort zone, you can like, there's the door, right? Like we didn't, I didn't say it exactly that blunt, but it was the message. Like you need to be, have an open mind to be in this, you know, into this workshop. And it was a three hour talk. It was not for the faint of heart. Wow. And um, it was intense. So we showed the mechanics of channeling. We um, showed our, our case, some case study data, which I had never gotten before from current clients. We decided to pull some cool data about how people are experiencing sessions, which may be likely what we see as an outcome from the research. And social workers were so open to it. And what I think is awesome about this is that the westernized medical model, which mental health often follows, ignores, I think, the indigenous earth cultural roots of people. And so in social work specifically tends to attract people of various backgrounds 
more so than other um, other mental health licenses. And the reason for that is because social work tenants involve system change. So a lot of cultures uh, that have social workers are helping in like Haiti and Jamaica and other places where in, in neighborhoods where people are struggling um, culturally. So social workers tend to, you know, our education is different and that we learn about systems change. So I think, of, you know, this is a good field to bring something like channeling in. But honestly, after the workshop, I had over a dozen people approach me um, of color who are like, thank you for talking about mysticism. I grew up with mysticism in my family and I entered this field and I'm not allowed to talk about it here. And it's really cool to see it coming in. And it was an, I was an unexpected result for me to have people be so supportive. And it, I, I was not making that connection, you know? And, and really when I did my presentation, I was like, look, I'm a white girl talking about channeling, but let's not get it twisted. Like the Olmec, right? And the Aztec, like it, like indigenous cultures channeled their ancestors from the beginning of time. And I'm just talking about it now because I'm a licensed person who does this work, but I am in no way the creator of this. I think it's time we have more conversations about this work existing in, in academia. And, you know, it just was, it was an awesome first step for us. Well, I personally am so grateful that you're leading this charge or being part of leading this charge. And I love your, your humbleness too, as well. So that's really important to call out. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different things that come up for me and like selfishly, I'm like, Ooh, I want to ask you about uh, how did it feel afterwards? Cause you and many listeners know my story of like chasing success or peak experiences. Then there's kind of like that time of integration, that reset oh. that can, that we can slip into depression. And I, hear you responding to that so we're just going to go there we're going to come back to the other stuff uh, but let's go there for a moment was there any yeah. period of like a maybe a depression or how did it feel afterwards yeah you know the crash was for me in the duty of the execution which is no mm -hmm. small feat because after having that experience of the glamour, so to speak, of being a pioneer in something and talking about it in public for the first time. Then I came home and we now have 125 people applying to a hundred person study in 72 hours. And now it's like, oh man, like we need to get to work. And beyond that, we've, you know, that there's very rigid timelines for research, right? So it's like, if somebody doesn't have a session within the 14 day window, for example, that we set up, um, their data doesn't count. And mm -hmm. we have to answer to our governing body about why there's a deviation and write up a report and all these things. And, you know, so for me, I feel like, oh, I didn't realize the closeness and the proximity of these deadlines and the way it would feel and the heaviness of having to execute that. And I'm a pretty like gritty executor. It's just like part of my natural skill set and it feels heavy for me. Um, and so I think that's been part of that like sobering reality. Um, there's like details and tediousness and um, like all kinds of watching timelines of people in the process at different stages and moving parts and people. And it's like, wow, like this is, this is a lot. And, you know, I kind of said to my husband, uh, how I did the math, how long would it take for me to get a hundred people through two sessions? And it's about eight months. So I'm like, all right, eight months in a straight jacket. Like I could do that, you know? And so I, I think it's that, right? Like if there's no microphone and like gold tassels on your breasts and fancy presentations and PowerPoints, it's just you like, you know, you know, getting up and doing the sessions in the same way for each person, because we want to like make it systematized so that it is as consistent as possible. And in, in it's, it feels heavy for me, for sure. And I'm leading a team that's like really into it and um, looking to me to kind of guide that light. And so that feels heavy too. Like I'm leading these folks who are participating in this research. So it's just been like a labor of love. I, you know, I, I feel like it's important to speak about that. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, you're birthing something. And I, I say this often, like if I realized the work that was going into this when I started it, I would have maybe thought twice, but the universe mm. has opened the door for me to do this in a way where I wasn't seeing that until I was already in the birth canal. 
-hmm. And then it's like, well, you can't turn around and go back now. You just got to be born, you know? So I feel like this process is divine in nature in that like whatever's being asked of me is being asked of me in the moment. And I just rise to that occasion. Um, And I think the moment of speaking in front of people is like, ah, yeah, this is why we're here. We're here to like inspire like this conversation and start this conversation. That's like the, the goal in my heart. And it started off honestly, quite selfishly, Sam, it's funny that you mentioned my humbleness, but um, it started off quite selfishly because I was like, I'm tired of going to this conference and talking about Buddhism. That's not the work I do every day. And I hate a system that doesn't let me be myself. And I kind Mm -hmm. of felt grumbly about it. So like, I'm going to do something that enables me to apply to this conference and talk about Akashic Record. And then I imagined myself filling out the application and was like, I want to talk about an imaginary library and how I heal mental health with it. I'm like, they're not going to buy that shit like no day (laughs) per week. So what do I got to do? Well, I got to do a case study and then maybe I'll do a real study because why would you do a case study and waste that data? Because if it's not approved by an IRB, it's not publishable. It's not considered valid, considered bullshit if you don't get it approved. So I ended up rolling down this mountain of going through this formal process. And then I was like, wow, like this is like way bigger than me. This is about like some student someday is going to look on PubMed or Google research and be like, did someone ever look at Akashic Records and mental health? And our study will be there. Mm -hmm. And like that makes me so emotional because I feel like this is all like always what I wanted out of life was to leave a legacy of change in some way. And I think I believe I do that with people individually, but there's something about doing that in a public sort of big way that pushes up against the system that makes my heart really happy. And I am excited to see where this goes. And honestly, where I'm at now, I still don't know what's gonna come after this. Uh, Sarah, who I've hired to work with me, she's like, I can't wait to do more studies with you. And I was (laughs) like, I can't even go there right now. (laughs) Like, My brain can only live in the birth canal of one womb at a time. And let's just get through this. But I feel like something amazing is brewing. And it's really cool to see, you know, maybe I'll live hopefully as long as possible to see what what comes of it. Well, I am so proud of you, Candice, and it's Thank such an inspiration. And yeah, I love you receive that with confidence. There's so much. Uh, I, I just encourage everyone listening to feel the energy behind Candice's intention and what she said. And if you're someone who listens to this podcast a lot, it, you'll probably get that same feeling from when you hear me speak, because I've learned so much from you, Candice, straight up about embodiment. And one of the things that I learned better from you than anyone else that I've been really teaching a lot recently is energetic hygiene. And this is really what you're talking about here, because not only do you have the study, but you are mother of two children, yeah. right? And I guess you'd call them, t- how old are they again? Well, three and eight. Mm -hmm. three and eight and you have brian your husband and you're training people on how to work with the akashic records like so that they can read it for themselves you're doing client one-on-one record sessions you're doing the the mastermind the free community you're doing a monthly prediction call you're doing what what else is it the group i was in where it's the group akashic like you have all these programs on top of it like it's a lot right it truly Truly is like, let's really look at that. So how is it like not getting to the stuff that we've covered in the past with energetic hygiene, but like, how is it now that you're really like allowing yourself to feel everything that's coming up and process it so you can show up for yourself to show up for everyone else and what your mission is? Yeah, thank you for that. I feel like this question that you're asking is like such a powerful personal question I've been in recently. And I've stopped doing a few things that just didn't feel good, even though they were a you know, productive or made money in the business or helped people. I just couldn't do them because they didn't feel good anymore for me. And I think around the, in the world of um, energy hygiene, like I think a step above that, which I think is a compass that is ever evolving is the compass of what is authentic to me? Mm. What is authentic to me? And that's probably an evolving question because we're evolving, you know, people. And so, you know, I'm in my Uranus opposition right now, which is like midlife crisis age, according Mm -hmm. to like mainstream phrases. And what's cool about that sort of astrological moment is that it challenges you to be more real. It challenges you to be like, who are you really and what really matters? And I think we should be asking ourselves that question all the time. And for energetic hygiene choices to happen, we need to know 
what is in alignment with our heart center. And so I'm feeling this like dangerous edginess about me that's like creeping onto the scene at this age of my life where I'm like, I'm doing the bolder things. I'm doing the things that might get me in trouble, right? Like could be like my license, you know, I'm still licensed as a therapist. I'm like showing up in these places, doing these things that are a little bit taboo. And I like the danger of that, right? I feel like there is a sense of saying no and walking away from the things that don't feel good and giving myself permission to do the things that are fulfilling. And I think that's a general statement, but for me personally, I'm noticing a walk into a much more like Aries, Marsy, irreverent kind of energy, kind of pushing back a little bit on um, what's expected. Um, and, and that's tough for me because, you know, people are like, but you know, I don't you have a cancellation? Don't come on, you know? And so there's this call to be like, sure, but I'm just getting like clearer and clearer about the work in the world is like a living embodiment of me. And it won't be high frequency if I'm not authentic. So mm. I have to only put work that really represents who I am. And if that has to keep changing and evolving, then it will. Um, and I'm committed to that. And I think that's the kind of the higher level perspective of energy hygiene. It's truly that intimacy with who you are and the balls to like execute that. And that's where that Mars energy comes in for me, right? Like the, you know, the, the umph and the gusto to, to kind of break a few um, eggs in order to make an omelet, you know? Yeah, I have a buddy from college who used to always say that the uh, <laughs> uh, crack some shells, make an omelet or something like that. Yeah, yeah. whatever it is. Um, so authenticity. So there's a few things coming up here. Um, yeah. I re-listened. No, I didn't really re-listen. I opened up the Google Doc that I made after we did the career transitions podcast. And for anyone that is in the midst of a career transition, I think that's episode either 197 or 199. It might be 199. And there's a Google Doc that I made of notes because it was so good. I listened to the podcast after interviewing Candice to take notes for myself. And I opened up that Google Doc recently because I was sending it to someone and it started off something about like when you're in alignment and like, you know, getting yourself in alignment. And this person asked me, cause I was doing a coaching call with them. And I said something about um, looking at where you're out of integrity. Right. And there's a, a delineation here between alignment, integrity, and authenticity, but it feels like it's very thin. We're pretty much pointing to like the same thing. How would you say those three are different? Yeah. So alignment, integrity, and authenticity. Authenticity, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that these are synonymous in lots of ways. If we're going to split hairs and you're asking me for my take on it, I feel like um, I feel like integrity is the relationship that you have with your authenticity, right? Mm. So like, are you being true to who you are? I think authenticity is that honesty of like the the recognition of your heart's desire and the integrity is whether or not you're going to hear that you're going to listen to that you're going to connect to that i think about alignment as your position in the world with things with people with opportunities and whether that's aligning with your authenticity and if your integrity is um you know, speaking to you. And I think that like, it requires a, like self-assessment and it requires mm -hmm. on, you know, like a real honesty here to, to know those things. I mean, for me, it's less, it's not logical. I probably said less logical as if there's some logic. It's mostly non-logical when I make these decisions because the, the heart center is so obvious for me, right? Mm -hmm. The heart center is like, oh, this is like not fun or this is heavy or this doesn't feel good. And usually I'm confronted by a lot of things in my environment that, that are not in alignment, right? So I'm feeling like this thing come at me, right? And I think that's why there's a good tip too. Why you should just get out there and give some things a try because people in their head spend all this time trying to define what's going on for them and who they are and which project to do first or second. And sometimes you can imagine how something will go and then you go into it and your heart immediately tastes the sip of that. And it's like, oh no, right? Yeah. So you need to put yourself out there because that alignment piece comes in 
really quickly, right? Like, oh, this doesn't feel in alignment. And then integrity, like, are we going to be, are we going to like hold integrity to that, right? Like this thing. And, and I think for me, the hardest thing has been saying no to something that people are saying yes to, that, you know, people want me to say mm-hmm. yes to in my business. Like, this is helpful. I want you to do this. This feels good, right? Or or having to like stand up for myself, right? When someone's like, you know, you, um, you know, in my personal life, like you didn't, make this choice, you know, and it hurt my feelings and and I'm sort of like owning their, you know, whatever my role is, but like not taking on somebody else's stuff. Like Mm -hmm. I think this idea of alignment we may talk about with career, but it's really with everything. We can feel what is true um, versus what is not. And I think once the mind gets involved, it can be way more complicated than that. And we can muddy it up pretty quickly. Yeah, thank you for entertaining that because, I mean, honestly, I could keep asking you so many more questions uh, about that specifically, but I want to get into other things. One thing I will say just in hearing you break that down, you mentioned the word like logic. And I do think of like the integrity piece being more of like that grounded masculine thinking logical type of energy. And like, Um, it it seems to me that like, if we yeah. were to look at like the book, the four agreements, you know, like, uh, is it honor your word? I think that's what it is. It's basically yeah, be impeccable true. with your word. Uh-huh. Yeah, Be impeccable with your word. Like that's integrity to me. Right. Yeah. So if we were to look yeah. at like integrity and this is actually really fascinating, but if we're to me, at least if we were to look at integrity <laughs> and authenticity, and we could probably come up with a few more, those would be like the pillars that lead you to knowing if you're in alignment or not, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Anyways. All right. I want to close the loop on the research study so we can get into yeah. some fun stuff. Uh, I mean, this has sure. all been fun, but some, you know, a little bit, uh, we'll just call it, uh, I don't want to use the word conspiracy. We'll just talk about thought manipulation <laughs> and energetic manipulation. We'll get into that stuff anyways. So to close the loop on the research and everything that you're doing there, you've been a therapist for what, like 15 years? Is that right? Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. And in the past, let's call it year or two, what percentage of your business would you say you're serving your clients in a traditional way you were trained as a therapist? I mean, for the past five years, all of my clients, a hundred percent of my clients are Akashic Records. And I do integrative therapy, which is channel the record and then do some d- discussion and dialogue and unpacking of that. And I think that that has maybe more of a therapeutic element, but 100% has been Akashic Records. And in your own words, why did you make the switch from traditional therapy to Akashic Records? You know, this is going to sound crazy, but I did it because it's what was being asked of me by Mm -hmm. people right like it was it was a very interesting like call out of this traditional practice and I could have stayed in corporate America and my corporate America for mental health clinicians usually involves like leadership and you know being a clinical director and which which I was um of a larger facility and I started doing this work and people kept calling me to do this work. And I was like, well, I guess I'll spend more than one day a week doing this work. And it just like wildfire. I got called in full time and out of my personal, you know, business. And so what's, what's powerful about that, I think is like people are, and that's probably why, you know, when I did the research, I started that. It's like, you know, it's been many years since this has been like on fire in, in my life. Like people want this kind of help. Um, you know, it's almost like the world is waking up to Mm -hmm. this sort of, you know, these modalities as being useful. And you can see that in plant work and in breath work and in all the altered states type work much more online now than ever before. And why do you feel that your clients are getting better quote unquote results, uh, with the Akashic records than traditional therapy? Well, our, our take on that is that it's an altered states experience while you're conscious Mm. because we activate some cellular memory that your soul has knowledge of from a past life while you're in the 3d so there's this almost like this clash of a moment where like oh my gosh i'm having this past life emotional experience but logical brain in this reality and so it kind of forces integration real time for people 
And I mean, I think that's what is happening because I've observed it many times, but also the ability to have like practical why, like, mm-hmm. why am I experiencing this? And like, how do I navigate this with the highest healing seems to offer a lot of direction and peace and empowerment for people. Um, you know, they're like, oh, I've been trying to figure out this problem for all my life and I can't quite, now I know, you know, the understanding and self-awareness seem to be really high themes for people. Um, also permission giving, surprisingly. So most people will say like, oh, there's a voice in my head that kind of believed or thought the things you're saying and now to hear you say them, you know, it's ringing all the bells. And what's going on there is I think, again, we're, we're, we're highlighting some cellular memory that's activating something in people. And, and we are arguing, you know, that it is an altered state's experience, but you're not out of your body, which I think is super interesting for the integration that can happen from Akashic sessions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. And because we, uh, so many of us, myself include, uh, are whether consciously or subconsciously looking for ways to disassociate and be out of our body. So that's a good point being landed and ground and feeling it somatically and integrating. Um, this is amazing. The reason why I ask those questions is because that is the importance of the work that you're doing with the research study, because it's literally backed by that and your clients are demanding of you from that. So I think that is an important thing to highlight. Now, transitioning into these other topics, we're going to talk about like the illusion and everything else. I'm just going to hand it over to you. And this is going to be you're you do your thing and i'll do my thing when i have qu- clarifying questions sound good okay yeah i mean i i'm i'm we have a couple of topics we floated you and i and so we're i'm just gonna like trust my intuition and dive into to them as well and i'll pause and you can interrupt certainly to ask questions but you know sam and i always like to to bring forward topics that are progressive and that speak to the current season of time and that things that that people might be curious about. And so something that I brought forward as a discussion is this idea of um, navigating um, illusion and why we can be disillusioned now more than ever. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for people to feel disconnected from their bodies, disconnected from their sovereignty. Um, And you might say, well, why is that now more than ever? And I think a lot of it has to do with the ushering in of the like Aquarian era. And for those who follow like astrology or don't, I'll give you a quick take on that. Like Aquarian energy is about disruption. It's about, um, uh, you know, kind of going your own way and questioning society it's also about the advancement of technology. And so I think all of a sudden we've like entered the way it looks to me and the way that it feels in the Akasha, like a magician's room. And there's all kinds of people standing up and saying they don't agree with something and they're creating something new and technology is blowing up literally with AI. And the Akasha is like, man, like there's so many more smoke and mirrors and you have so much better technology now to create more smoke and mirrors that people um, can be really sort of addicted by that. And so for me, I get curious when the Akasha says things like this, and it almost always comes up because somebody's asking a question in their own record. And then I hear that answer and I'm like, personal note to go back and ask them more about that, you know? So I end up in those like rabbit holes with these questions because of that. And, you know, so my question for them, and I think all of us might be curious about is, um, you know, how is it that we are getting addicted to various um themes and when i say themes um there there's there's a cycling of them there's larger themes and there's like undercurrent themes and and it it, it's intentional according to the akasha field meaning like the powers that be the energies on the planet those maybe of less light and love there tends to be this uh theme of like outrage right? Like there's an interesting correlation with that in the aquarian era like so we should be outraged by something right now And I think that that is sensationalized and inflated and reflected. And then it's like a ball that rolls down. Um, And that that's sort of, I would say a shadow aspect of Aquarian energy because Mm -hmm. disruption by nature is like part of the thing. Um, But like we forget the element of collaboration and healthy, diverse conversation, which I think is truly marked in Aquarian energy, not 
like rebellious war energy. And so we see the shadow aspect of, of Aquarius showing up in war, like quite literally. And then we're responding to that with more war in our words and our thoughts. And you can see what it's doing, right? It's a humongous tumbleweed of like rage and, and disconnect. And I think, you know, the Akasha always says something really profound, like it doesn't matter what side of the coin you fall on. If you're participating in the energy, you're no different. Mm -hmm. Right. So like you, if you are the energy of separation or you are the energy of like outrage or war, then like, it doesn't matter where you stand, you're participating in that energy. Let's and unpack so, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. If you feel like so, that's a good place to pause. Yeah. I, I, Cause I mean, we're talking about politics, right? I mean, politics is a vague word, right? What is yeah. that? We're in an election year. The time of this recording, it's late August, 2024. I almost forgot what year it was for a second there. But, you know, we have the election coming up in a couple of months. And what we see is division, right? Like, and this is something that I've been passionate about since the pandemic and the lockdowns, especially being in spiritual communities, because in my sphere, I've seen so many people that are into spirituality, uh, conscious living and things like that, where they've gone on the complete other end of fear, where they're almost ridiculing the people that are in fear of, say, back then the virus, right? And then it's like, how do you guys realize that you're just spreading more fear on your side, right? And that's what I'm hearing from you. Like if you're caught in that coin, I think that's really important to let that sink yeah. in. Yeah, and I want to say that this energy began according to the Akasha in and around 2020. And so it's not necessarily related to just this uh, election year, but we're seeing a spike now in our, our country. Um, but it's happening all over. You know, you don't have to look far in other countries or, or the news, right, to see war literally happening, to see, you know, conflict and hierarchy and polarity everywhere that, you know, to your point in the pandemic was a huge theme. Um, and it's like this, but for me, it's very peculiar. Like just because someone has an opinion, you have an opinion about what's best for you. Like I, I can't even wrap my head around the concept that that means automatically that everyone should also have that take. And then mm -hmm. therefore the world is in peace. Mm -hmm. And I think from an Akashic perspective, like the world is in peace because we appreciate and commingle with diversity and we have those conversations in tables. And really what's happening in the Aquarian energy now is the multiplication of ideas, which is the, which is towards the right end. But, you know, because of the larger themes and undercurrent themes of, of deviation, going back to that sort of comment of like, why is there more disillusion or illusion? Because like, oh, we should be outraged. There's so many diverse things, you know, thoughts. We should be outraged, right? And so like, mm -hmm. now there's like this other, I think animal um, in the space that is not really, uh, you know, here to be awakened. And, and here's a thought that I want everyone to think about who's listening is how do you know if you're caught up in that, right? Like, how do you know you're part of that? I think like instinctual gut responses are typically traumatic ones, mm -hmm. right? When yeah. you are sitting and you're in, you're working with the observation of your form, your body and your emotions and your thoughts, when you're an observation of that, when you are a witness of that, when you're depersonalizing that, you're less likely to respond from a trauma place. And you're, you'd are you be surprised that that response may be much, very much deviated or different from the mainstream world. But because the energy is like a hot potato, it is literally energetic and it's addictive. This like, for example, I'm using this outrage energy, but it's certainly not the only one you see that you hear that you're on social media it's everywhere you have a gut response then you're part of that and you get sucked into that sort of tumbleweed and so it is really important to pay attention to how we're responding i think obviously media breaks and opportunities to get silent and say if i were to have an opinion on this that wasn't connected to anyone else what would it be and I hear the Akasha even now in my head saying everybody lies different there on the continuum. Some of us drink real hardcore from that cup of, you know, external validation, external mm -hmm. approval. And some of us just reject it entirely. And so it is a delicate balance of, you know, am I just doing the opposite of what everybody's doing? <laughs> right. Um, or am I always doing what people ask me to do? And I think that, you know, that's a, your own kind of personal hustle and your own Akasha, but we have different experiences there. And I think some tips here are like pause, 
Um, don't be afraid to like take space, uh, cut off social media, um, speak up when something mm -hmm. doesn't feel good for you. Um, stay rooted. I think if you notice your heart rate racing and you have that like hot flash feeling and the tingling in your hands, like that sometimes is a very clear trauma response or sometimes people have in the form of anxiety or anger when they're experiencing something like they're about to speak up, like that's usually a trauma moment um, happening. And, you know, the Akashi would say, be present with those emotions, breathe with those emotions, depersonalize those emotions. Who are you interacting with those emotions? And what most people do instead, here's the kicker, is they just react um, spontaneously from those emotions. And that's why, you know, we're going to get sucked into that because the dials are being turned up. The heat is a little bit hotter in the kitchen globally, um, you know, nationally. And so, you know, the Akasha is very concerned. And I think AI is playing a huge role in that too. There's a lot of things we're seeing and experiencing per the Akasha that's not actually happening. Yeah. Oh, uh, can you tell us more about that last piece? What's <laughs> not actually happening? Yeah, I mean, like, like the dramatization of certain events and uh, that are that's happening in the world. Uh, I feel like this is a cryptic answer. I'm not like deliberately hiding a specific thing, but this is just like the phrase I hear in the Akasha. Like, oh yeah, the things you hear, the things you, they said, remember when we stopped believing what the newsman said? They're like, yeah. remember that? It's a continuum, right? When now some of us look at the TV and we're like, I, you know, I'm not into that. They said, now you need to start asking the question of, this is the time where we stop believing what we see. So, so this is the very first feeling not even a thought that i had when i heard about trump's assassination which was about a month uh, attempted sorry excuse me attempted assassination that was a different timeline that uh, it was an assassination perhaps uh, if that was a freudian slip who knows adding too much to the pot here all right yeah. so what came through was how do we even know that actually happened because unless i know someone that was actually there i.e you candace or someone that i know not know heard from a friend of a friend and you actually know from that firsthand experience and i'm not trying to go too wild here and say that sure. i don't think that actually happened but this is right. a perfect example to be like how do we actually even yeah. know um, so, I mean, I think that this is a good question to ask ourselves. I mean, I hear the Akasha coming in and saying, we want to be asking that question every time we see something like pause, breathe, wait. Did this really happen? Is this something that um, feels true to me? Like this feels like an important thought. I also hear them simultaneously say every, and this is an Akashic answer that no one will like, everything's already happened and not happening on all the energetic layers. Mm -hmm. Why do you care so much about the 3D in this moment? Mm. And, I, and I feel like that's very much why AI is here because it's a mm. physical digital representation of us not attaching any longer to this third dimensional world we're living in. So like my body lights up when you say that, and I feel that that prana, right? And a lot of times that's an indicator of like, yes, this is truth. Why sometimes do you think our body gives us that indicator of, yes, this is truth. And then maybe we find out later on and not tying it to what you just said, but previous is previous life examples for me where the body responded somatically in a way where I'm like, oh, this feels true. But then something happens later on where it's like, oh, it was, did I just get excited? And then my body responded excited. And maybe that wasn't actually like in, intuition from like a higher source coming through. Could you help delineate that? Yeah. I mean, I feel like you're asking a very like tough question, which is how to know the signals of your own personal body. Right. And that's mm -hmm. like a tough question for and, and that would differentiate you know per person like how they would know that um i'm gonna ask the i'm in my own record i'm gonna ask them about that <laughs> they you know what's coming up is that within your own heart there is a a, a knowing and that that knowing is separate from like excitement. Um, it is like a, a knowing that 
even when you have insight that something's not going to go well or does go well is irrelevant. The knowing is still in there and that we all have access to that knowing. Um, and in your case, that there's been a stronger sense of, of practice around internalizing that knowing, like you've had to work to that. And, and they said, and you're unlike, you know, uh, not unlike most of your listeners, which is, is that the mind is like extremely clever. And you have to remember that, you know, the mind, if you have a, a chirpy mind, like a Virgo mind that analyzes things, a mercurial mind, or if you have a lot of your own shadow work that's not been addressed, it's going to be very hard to isolate and pinpoint that inner knowing. But they're telling me it's always there and it's always right. And it's a good time now in history to practice that because we're being lifting out of what others are deeming as real. We're lifting out of that in this like fifth dimensional experience and through technology, what we see, what we hear, we're starting, you know, that's kind of like, like, I almost think about it like anti-gravity, <laughs> like everything's mm -hmm. lifting up and now we're still having to be grounded and figure out who am I, where am I and what matters to me. Um, so that's probably not a great answer, but I, I think it, I describe it better when we can talk about what's in the way of that more so than how to know. Right. Yeah. And speaking to what's in the way of that, my follow up to that, which you kind of started to go there was we tend to gaslight ourselves when we're first learning to trust our intuition. And what is like a healthy way to realize when we're gaslighting ourselves so that we're not just spiritually bypassing and being like, oh, no, this is my intuition, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So I think we gaslight. Um when we don't want to do hard things. Mm. Um, I think we gaslight when um, it feels like work to trust our, our intuition. Our ego will be like, well, this would make me unpopular. I might lose money. I have to make all these changes. This seems really scary. So this or intuition maybe I have. Maybe we're afraid of like the unfamiliar too. And like our yeah. true power, that could be a piece of it too, right? Yeah, I don't want to stretch and have to be seen. And then, then what? What does it mean? You know, what is that going to ask of me or require of me? Um, intuition, according to the Akasha, I think we've had other conversations, is like a quiet, delicate whisper that doesn't stop. It like calls you forward. And when I say forward, I think about like your higher self grabbing you by like the shirt collar forward. Forward means you stretch. It means something, you're stepping into something that feels a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and it will be repetitive, this sort of intuition. Now it is louder and very clear and dialed into the radio station if you can eliminate um, the distractions. But imagine everything we've talked about today so far, and this is only a few items, right? Like the AI stuff and media and friends and family and then ancestral trauma and then your own shadow work and then the way your mind's working and then the logistical things you're juggling in life. If there's no silence in your life, how are you hearing that whisper? Mm. Right? So I think the magic and the mystery and um, I think the sorcery these days is in getting truly silent and patiently listening to what is there and of being like a extremely discerning and, and pairing away what's part of the not self. Um, and the not self is always tied to, I think, safety. The ego is, is, is usually like involved in that, right? I don't want to do that because that seems really scary. And, you know, that's going to be painful and all of that. So I think like that's a red flag that if you're listening to your intuition because it's keeping you safe, that's not your intuition. Your intuition, I this is a great answer once. Someone asked me that, how do you know it's your intuition or it's you need it's safety? And the Akasha says, your intuition is like for safety is very loud. When it's time to like run from a tiger, it's like run from the damn tiger now. You're not going to get a whisper to run from a tiger like six months in advance. Right? Yeah. Like there's no tiger there now. So like sometimes we use intuition as an excuse to, you know, oh, it's my intuition telling me that I shouldn't act on this great opportunity. Um, and that's not the case. Right. It's actually our fear masquerading as our intuition, our ego masquerading as our intuition.
Hmm. I'm trying to let that one land. Um, cause one thing that came through right away was a conversation I had with someone about a career transition and uh, right. And I, I know we talked about this in that podcast, but like it, if you're newer on this path and you're like, oh, wow, I've been working a corporate job and this is in, in alignment and I just want to get out. Like the worst thing you can do is just uh, put your two weeks in and not know what you're doing next and just be stuck there, right? I forgot where I was going with this, but it was that that piece of like the whisper. It's not, so yeah. in that situation, it's a whisper because some people might hear that with sirens perhaps, you know what I'm saying? Right. I'm trying to play sure, contra sure. contrarian to understand it more. That's all. Well, yeah. So I love that. So, but what I hear you describing is the difference between knowing the decision and acting on the decision. Mm -hmm. Right. Knowing you should quit a job, but then like now what, what's the most mindful, helpful, grounded way that I go about that for me and my family. If, if those are like 3d considerations, so I think like in the first example, it's like the way we lie to ourselves about the decision itself mm. versus once we make that decision, like run from the bear now or the tiger now, um, you know, it doesn't mean we have to run now. We, we can also reflect on what needs to happen. And I think that's where the mind can be a lot more useful for us. But I don't know that the mind is great in, in deciding if it's good or not. The mind should observe if it's embodied, if the intuition is true. And, and sort of going back to that authenticity of, of what to do. The mind can observe that. The mind shouldn't be involved in that more, more so than just being aware, but it can be really involved in the, when do I do this? How does it look? You know, sort of the marching orders. Yeah. Yeah. Having like a roadmap for sure. And using discernment. So definitely go back to the career transition podcast. It's in the show notes. If you want to go deeper down that rabbit hole. So in terms of building, trusting your intuition and knowing what's real and what's not and all of that, like how does your daily spiritual practice play a role into that? Yeah. So this is something we talked about, you know, before, I think I, I sort of highlighted most of it here already but it's about like um you know getting really silent and becoming intimately connected to the ebbs and flows of your own energy landscape and just like any earthly terrain um it's evolving right the ocean is you know waning and waxing with high tide and low tide and trees are blowing or the leaves are falling nothing is static right so I think it's like a mistake to experience ourselves in like a like a silo or a um, a dark cave of like, well, this is only who I am now, and I just participate in spiritual practice to um, to connect to my higher self, or because I'm supposed to, or because now I'll live longer if I meditate. Whatever the reason is, I think that we have like a unique opportunity not just to participate in spiritual practice, but to be intimate with the watching of the evolvement of our living being, right? So what's new today? Mm. What is the, you know, what, what's the status of my landscape? And it's like, really the image for me is like sitting on a cliff and like watching nature and, and imagining that my, as my life, right? Like every day I sit on this cliff and I watch nature and I notice the new things in the forest forest and I notice the status of the water are we doing that kind of spiritual practice are we not just praying for the things we're you know we're missing and being grateful for the things we have and checking the boxes or just the silent meditation and all that's valuable but I think to not be sucked into the you know disillusionment we have to be mindful of the of the way that our our being is is existing yeah, I, I love this so much because it's it's something I speak about a lot where spiritual practice gets turned into a to-do list, which is the opposite of a spiritual practice because the one piece of discernment to know when we're like kind of in our, our sadhana, if you will, would be that we are focused in that current moment of how does it feel now? How am I being, right? As opposed to like, oh, every day I meditate and do breath work or whatever thing is at this time, let me check that box. And then afterwards you're like, 
okay, let me go on to the next thing, right? And you bring up that example of the cliff. It reminds me of uh, some time in Malibu over the past couple of years uh, going to the cliff out there and being out there and watching the seals and being in nature, which, I mean, I have that in my backyard here in Santa Cruz. And hearing you speak, I'm like, huh, you know, the I need to take my own advice for this current season I've been in, in the past few days, week or a eh, few days, because now my spiritual practice is starting to come back to being a to-do list. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's something for us all to just remember, like we don't need to have shame and guilt around it. It's just building right. that awareness because as soon as you get to that point of awareness, you're in it because it's not about going and doing the thing. Now you just got there, Right. Yeah. And I think our society is conditioning us to, and I want to say this really strongly, conditioning us to not be in touch with our authenticity and the inner landscape in this way. And in even the ways that it's not socially acceptable to answer honestly to how are you doing? Right? Like, I think that that's taboo, right? So you asked me before we started this, like, how are you? I'm like, man, I'm in the gridlocks. I'm in like execution phase. It's like feeling heavy, man, you know? And it's like, I can say that to you. I should say that. And I do practice to say that to anyone who gives me the throwaway line of how are you? But I think like, how can we truly know our inner landscape if we're not answering honestly, Mm -hmm. you know, to anyone in our lives? And we're not spending that silent time to watch the breathing of our own being. And and then we're inundated with to-do lists and expectations and huge energetic themes that are rolling by these tumbleweeds of outrage and choose a side and, you know, whatever it is, like we get lost, right? We lose ourselves. And so if we're, we're talking today about really knowing self i think a real practical way to do that in addition to spiritual practice is you know let your life be a reflection like of your authenticity and and use use honesty in your words very simply use honesty in your words to anyone who asks you anything i think especially the question of how are you doing and I think it would be it would do the world a lot of good for some people to answer that honestly and then other people to be surprised and feel uncomfortable by that. It's like, yeah, welcome to like real life and real living, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like snooze fast anytime I'm in a circle with people and I have lots of different circles I run in because I'm a parent of small children and they're, you know, there's a, a sense of like everything, how, how, how's work, you know, it's, how's it thing? Oh, it's going, you know, it's like, I just like, oh, I can't be in that conversation. It just feels like it, it's cold and absent from like the realities of my truth. And so I practice that in all of my circles and, you know, surprisingly people ask me now about my life in much more specific ways. Um, mm-hmm. and, and in ways I thought previously, nobody would want to hear about or would be too taboo. And I feel like we have to stop taking care of people. And and I think we have to exa- examine what's going on with us that makes us want to hide our authenticity. And then we start. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm chomping at the bits here. I'm ch- I can't contain anymore. My no. tail's wagging. <laughs> no, no, Sam, go. But thank you. Thank you for all that. All right. So yes, 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 and yes. You know, I got back into the business world about two years ago. And one of the pieces of advice I got was like, Hey, I know you just wrote this book called Soul Life Balance, but if you speak to corporate, you can't talk about soul life balance. So I end up saying, screw that, F that. I'm going to still talk about this and I'm still going to go out there. And I also dimmed it down quite a bit. And then this past year, I wrote a book, Overcome the Overwhelmed Six-Step Breath Process. It just came through. It was honestly channeled more and it was amazing. But at the same time, like for a couple of years now, I've wanted something that would be like, more towards like a businessy demographic. And I had this feeling, this notion that this book would like take off and then it didn't take off. And then I started to feel different. Now I'm going on a tangent here. So let me bring this back. Point okay. being, I resonate with this, uh, this piece of like, I don't want to dim my light in these circles that aren't like in alignment right? They're in alignment for me. Um, So I'm trying to navigate that now currently. But the bigger piece that I wanted to address was this question of how are you doing? And to just like break the fourth wall, I going into this podcast, 
have been envisioning like seeing you and doing this podcast and be like, oh man, Candace is, uh, we're going to have that conversation of like, hey, how are you doing? Because that's just what humans do. I don't really know a better way of going about it. And I was like, honestly, like I haven't been doing doing that well the past couple of days and also i'm not sure if i'm going to spew that all on to candace and when we were present and we checked in we hopped on zoom and you asked me how i'm doing i was like i'm excited because all of a sudden i was excited and i think this is important because bringing it back to presence and moment to moment awareness any moment we can shift, right? Because I had some stuff come up personally in the past few days that have kind of kept me in this, like whatever I've been trying to get out of it. So I don't want to show up with the energy of like, oh, it's been this way. And because now I'm telling my subconscious that, and I'm reinforcing that belief, I'm reinforcing that decision. So as soon as I can be present with you and be like, okay, even though I was thinking I might have to energetically dump uh, to be honest, whatever. And you know, I can't just hold space for me and all that. I'm like, wait, how do I feel now? No, I'm excited. And I can already feel that shift in me just by letting go of the narrative of the season that I was in. Mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're able to check in with yourself in the moment and arrive in the present moment. And maybe this present moment brings a feeling of excitement, even if the previous moment was not, you know, and I think that the fact that you're conscious of that is everything. Um, and when I say like most people, I don't know that I'd include you, but most people I think have a habit of just not, you know, maybe not being excited in the moment, for example, feeling a certain kind of way and then deliberately not being authentic about that. So what I'm seeing is three layers now that you're bringing this up and shout out to my homie, Chris Hager. He definitely helped me to see this as well. We didn't talk about this, but it was just some communications where he said things similarly when he was going through a really hard time in his life. He said, I was I'm just saying, people ask me, how are you doing? I just told him the truth. And that's how everything shifted. So I I'd say there's three layers that I'm seeing. One is that, how are you doing? Oh, everything is great. It's fine. It's fine. Good. Yeah. Second layer is like, oh my God, like I'm in this season of blah, 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 blah. And then third layer is like, this is how I am now, you know? And this is kind of like the evolution of like personal development into soul development. The personal development I feel like is like, oh, I'm going to talk about like what's currently going on. I'm going to actually be open. The soul or spiritual development is like, hey, let's drop into presence right now. How am I feeling right now? You know? Yeah. And I think there's something to be said, which you didn't mention, but is super relevant is we all know people who energetically dump on other people yeah. emotionally. And I think we all don't want to be that. And maybe there's a fear of that also. Mm. And I think being authentic and honest about where you are in this moment and the moment before, whatever is true for you can still be shared from a deep sense of honesty without dumping on people. Like there's clearly space for that. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to when we have those tougher conversations. I'm looking at my notes here and I can't uh, yeah. Oh, speak up. There it is. Um, you mentioned like in, when you're feeling that heightened state and you're feeling that you need to speak up and one of the things you can do is like feel into that present moment. And I was actually going to ask you that, what do you recommend? And it, it, cause that's one of the hardest things. I mean, my new book is all about this and emotions are energy in motion, our body processes, those energies in 90 seconds. What can we actually do? Breathe, feel, and think intentionally. If we can just remember and anchor that and breathe to slow down, feel, allow yourself to feel it, then think intentionally moving through it. Now I'm a work in progress here, right? You know, and I'm still trying my best to be like, okay, breathe, feel, think intentionally, breathe, feel, think intentionally. For you personally, like when you get into that heightened or triggered or activated type state, what helps you to bring presence in the moment? Yeah. So I need emotional or energetic release. Hmm. I cannot ta tame the tiger or the lion or whatever large aggressive creature is moving through me in the moment, right? Like that doesn't work for me. I think um, it, so I have a big energy, I have a big energy. And so when it is angry or when it is sad, I have to allow myself space to be with the 
the movement of that. And I think I try to certainly depersonalize that and give heads up to my partner. Like I need space. I need to be in this emotion. I need to be with this anger. Um, you know, I love Thich Nhat Hanh. I use his tactics all the time. Like, and he has this beautiful poetic phrase of like, I am currently working with the feeling of blank. Mm. I'm doing my best to practice with it. Can you help me? And I use that practice in my life. And when that happens, the energy kind of sort of moves, uh, like almost peaks. And it is, I think, I'm sure biologically and chemically, like some kind of release. And then there's this re like relief that I experience. And then I can think intentionally, but I can't think intentionally when the emotion is high. And that's not for everyone, but I think for the people, I love that we're kind of different in that way because that, you know, we'll capture people who experience that differently. Um, my partner never needs to move energy emotionally before responding. He could just be grounded next to the earth and he can just speak intentionally at that point. Um, I need to move big energy. So that might look like yelling, you know, that might look like going for a run, you know, and sweating. It may look like, I, I think you made a comment once on a post I had, like walking five blocks with oh, heavy yeah. groceries for no reason. Like sometimes I just need to be with the energy. Um, when I was young, I used to throw trolls, uh, you know, the hair, the trolls. I threw like 30 of them at a wall when I was young, right? It's like didn't have space to express myself and I was moving the energy. And that, you know, I think it's important we validate that. And I have, a, you know, children, right? So I'm like, you, you got some big energy, you got some big feelings, buddy. Like, how can I help you move those feelings? Like, you know, what, what, what do those feelings need right now? And, you know, so I think that's just like, for me, how I'm able to be more conscious. And I know not to like have hard conversations or make big decisions in that moment. Oh, yeah. That's super important for me. Yeah, I, I think for all of us, right? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess I say that in that uh, maybe not everyone needs that kind of emotional release, but um, I certainly do. Well, at least to not make the big decisions in that space. Um, I think sure. that's important to highlight. Uh, the I lost it. <laughs> uh, oh, I know. So in a perfect world, my ideal world, your ideal world, like the every one that we're going to interact with can hold space for that, right? So it's not like, hey, I need to pause and go process and do this thing to move energy. When yeah. you are working with people that aren't necessarily on this path and you don't have the time and space to go and move that energy, what? how do you handle it then? You mean when I'm supporting someone else in that space? No, like say it's maybe a parent, you know, or uh, a friend, but someone who's not necessarily on the path of like, quote unquote, doing the work and they can't, you know, they can't necessarily hold space for you and you don't necessarily have the time and space to exit. So how are you going to handle in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I think self-preservation and taking care of yourself, right? I'm doing my best to practice with the emotion. Like you need to put your position yourself in a space where you can practice with that, with that feeling. And, um, and I think that you're the, the, the short answer is you, you need to be able to express that energy. I think that people that don't express that energy, um, end up with toxic health issues and all kinds of things. I see it every day in my practice, like the Akash is like, Oh man, the high blood pressure. Cause a lot of, you know, suppressed anger and rage and things things like this. So, I mean, it, there will be scenarios where I like, oh, I really had to bite my tongue to get out of that situation so that I can go be, you know, in a space with people where I can possibly, you know, process this better. Um, so I, I think the short answer is like, be with your people, but we are emitting all, all day, every day into this quantum field, our emotional landscape, you know, is, is being cultivated. And if you are allowing that authenticity in your own life and accepting it and working with it actively and awake, I guess, you know, whatever that means, you will be with people who can hold that space for you. And mm -hmm. it will be a rarity that you are around people who cannot. And when they cannot, you know, you um, take, you know, there's usually consciousness and you can be conscious in, in taking the space you need. And sometimes you'll make mistakes and you'll yell at someone, right? Or you'll do something you didn't want to do. And there's medicine in that also, right? Because we're human and that by design, we're imperfect. You know, uh, we I love talk yeah, go ahead. We didn't talk about your juicy question. I, and I want to make sure we were able to get to that. 
a juicy question about what was it? I wrote it down. Leaders, leaders. Oh, so I don't know if yeah. we want to talk about that. I, I'm I'm down to do that, and, and but I don't want to cut you off if you want to. No, yeah, it's a perfect transition. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so um, go for it. Okay, well, um, you know, I think that you know we talked before about um, you know having emotional responses to situations and including situations that we're seeing in our environment, like through politics. And um, I said something earlier that you're like, let's go back to that. So I think it's important to say it here, which is how we feel about anyone, like the people in our lives, right? But certainly our, our leaders politically, that the, the leaders that we have are energetic reflections of ourselves. Um, we can't possibly put anyone anywhere in our life, right? If it's in our bed or on a podium leading our country, that's not an energetic reflection of us and as a collective. And so, you know, that th there's what, what I think comes up in that in all of this conversation is the deep question of like, what energy am I contributing to this dynamic? And that was a perfect time for you to bring that up because where I was going was uh, this concept of external family systems where it's like we have our internal parts, but if we can use like mirror work and see someone else and be like, where's that in me? That's like the external, like physical manifestation of an internal part. So I think what what I feel coming from you in this this last five ten minutes or so of like handling these trigger moments with others is using that as an indicator of where we ourselves may be out of alignment because if that's being mirrored back to us the greater opportunity there is to take that time and space later on for that self-inquiry yeah and i would say it's tricky because we don't want to use that information as a form of shame or wrongness mm -hmm. like what's wrong about me i need to fix me um i think what i would invite everyone to do is to reflect on like i'm curious as to my strong energetic response or emotional response here and what's that about for me i think that's a juicy question we should always ask and then also like, and how do I want to continue to contribute to this collective? If it's a collective, maybe it's a political party. How do I want to contribute to that political party? How do I want to contribute to this family system, to this corporate job, to this interpersonal relationship, right? Um, what's that? And I would say, you don't need to ask that question if you have no emotional cord showing up, mm. because that emotional cord is often connected to that trauma stuff, and that shadow stuff or that past life stuff and so if you know the ideal goal according to the akashic field is to like look at something and be like wow you know that's very different than how i would feel or, or, or respond to that hmm. hmm and then you just write the neutrality energy and move along and then yeah. like how, how would i like to sow something that feels better for me so there's discernment but there is neutrality and mm -hmm. so i look at the you know political system I'm like oh there's discernment for me on what feels good and, and then there's contribution of how I want to sow my seeds. And I think if there were a strong emotional reaction, there gets to be the question of like, what's that about? What's that bringing up? And then in return, when I'm not having a big emotional release, which I wouldn't necessarily have around, you know, something like politics, but I may have around someone interpersonally triggering me, I can still then come to that decision of what do I want to sow? What do I want to put in to this situation? And the the quote was every leader is a reflection, is it of the collective or the individual consciousness? It's every leader is a reflection of our collective energetic. Collective, right? right. Yeah. So if so, then what? So if that's the case and these are the Then the, the leaders we have are the people we chose because they express our shadows. Mm-hmm right? And our pains and our strengths and our goals and our hopes and our mistakes and our egos. And can we look at those things fully uh, straight on? And, and are we happy there? And if not, right, if we don't like what we see, then how would we like to contribute 
to that energy in our own personal lives. Looking at the collective through the leaders and seeing it as an opportunity for self-inquiry for self while releasing shame and guilt by looking at it as an opportunity yeah. for growth. Here's an example. I look at leader A and I see a desire, a passion, you know, for X topic. Okay. I look at that, at one very small aspect and I feel connected to that. I see that that's a reflection of my, of my own because I'm passionate about that. Okay. How do I continue to sow into that concept in my individual life? Because I recognize that how I sow in my individual life is part of that collective weight. I look at leader B or leader A, maybe same one. And I say, oh, that's shadow behavior, that behavior of, um, you know, ignorance. I, that, I despise that ignorance. It's not, it's not an energy that I want to be. And so from a spiritual perspective, where in my life do I experience ignorance? How does it has, how has ignorance impacted me in my life? How do I feel about that really? And then we get to like get clearer about what comes up. Maybe the instability, the insecurity, the disregard, the disrespect. Maybe I would have experienced as a result of ignorance. I'm just making this up. Okay, how do I want to participate in my relationships with ignorance? Well, maybe I want to be more consciously educated, more consciously aware of what I'm saying in the world. Maybe I need to stop maintaining personal relationships with people who are... Um, who are in, in a lot of ways ignorant to things uh, in, in life that, that are my values. And so you can make those changes. I think that for someone listening to this podcast, who's listening to all this might say, that's BS, like it's all random. You know, we just, I don't know, maybe, I don't know if people that listen to your podcast would say that, but I think many in real life would, like we're just, the, we're just subject to the leaders who find their way to the stage. I feel like that's just such a cop out. Like everybody who comes forward and our human history has reflected the values of its citizens. Isn't that what democracy is about to begin with? Why wouldn't it also be about the energetic of that? It's about that literally. Like we vote for the people that, that represent our values, right? So I think yeah. like it's not that big of a jump to say that there's an energetic representation of that. And so I think it's a missed opportunity for our self-work and for the healing of this nation to look at these leaders and be like, for us, we have these people here that just don't, that aren't good. It's like, no, like, what about you is is creating this? And how are you sowing this in your own community, in your own life? Because everything that we've come to now is a reflection of the progress we've made up till now. And that's been reflected in the leadership as well. That's kind I, of a I love love the soapbox love the soapbox and i think for the listeners because i have a, a decent idea it's how do we ever really know right what a listener would be thinking about but i think most people that would tune into this the soul seeker podcast would still have that piece of programming with the self gaslighting and i know i have that which is why i have a feeling i'm attracting that right and sure. getting esoteric there but even hearing you say that before you got to the piece of like, if someone's listening and thinking it's all like just random chance, I already had that part and maybe you were picking it up, come through, but ah. that's the contrarian, right? Because that piece wants to be able to understand. It's not so much that that piece is sure. at this point in my journey, an adversarial voice. It's an sure. inquisitive voice and also so that, I can be better prepared when I'm having those conversations with people that are maybe not on the fence, but you know, like they're not even on the fence. They're behind the fence at that point. <laughs> sure, right. sure. Uh, yeah, I just well, wanted to, that up. what was that? I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. I just wanted to bring this in real quick because when I, I used to read this morning prayer every single day, and this is going to be an invitation for me to get back to this, but right here, I mean, it's long. I'm just going to read this specific piece right here. Um, okay. Right here. Uh, is that it? Every day. Through... Nope. I can't find it. Anyways, the, the gist of it was every day I'm looking at, every single interaction I'm having and seeing where is that in me. And when I can focus on my mirrors and all the, maybe not all, all the interactions, that's extreme, but keep that at the forefront, 
right? And get curious. That's when I feel most alive. And that's what it really feels like we're talking about here. Just to- yeah, totally. And I think like outside of the shame or the judgment that we may experience this sort of mirror process with, because I see that like the ignoring of the mirror or the total, like everything's my fault. I've manifested all the bad things that have happened to me and I need to change myself. Like I've seen that side of this coin as well. And I think aside from that, I'd like to maybe highlight that I, the idea of contribution. How do I, observing my personal relationship with this energetic, whatever that is, my personal relationship with this energetic, because you would know if there's an electric response, you have a relationship with it. Maybe you are the energy. Maybe someone has harmed you in that energy. Maybe who knows all kinds of scenarios. Given that, how do I want to contribute to the balancing of that energetic? How do I want to contribute to the balancing? And I think that is what I see in the world rippling, right? Like this is how we change things. Mm -hmm. Not sitting at home, pointing at a a TV screen and shaking our head and pretending that we're not like powerful energetic motors that are manifesting everything in our reality individually and collectively. I think we have an obligation to be like, how can we contribute meaningfully to the balance of all of our shadows? I I don't go on Facebook often, but I just uh, post last thing uh, because it feels like it's a full circle of what you're saying. But I looked up this quote by uh, it is Eleanor Roosevelt, because I remember hearing this a lot and I haven't heard it recently, but it seems like it applies now more than ever, especially with this topic. Great minds talk about ideas. Average minds talk about events and small minds talk about people. Now, uh, many I don't mean to single out the Democrats. I don't really align with either party, but I would say like any party could hopefully see that quote and see the wisdom in it. Yet when we are getting caught in the political landscape, to your point of like watching TV and shaking your head, the conversations that are happening between people are talking about people. They're getting caught up in the the person as opposed to the idea and what we want to actually build and live in. And that's the problem I have. So with that, Candice, we could keep going forever, which is why you're always coming back on the podcast. And I'm so grateful and appreciative that you came back and you're sharing with us everything that's going on. And like always, we're never really know where it's going to go. And we got no, to that we're all over today. Yeah went all over, which is usually the case. And if you guys want more structure, I highly gain in touch with Candice, maybe doing a session with her or joining her free community with the, the Healers Collective. Yeah, the Rasa Healing Network. Yep. Rasa Healing uh, Network. You can find all the links to that in the show notes. Candice, any final words on your end? No, I mean, it felt really powerful too, I think leave this on an uplifted note of really how we might contribute. I think that's an empowering concept. And I I would say, remember the cliff and notice the changes and tend, tend to that terrain. Love it. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Candice. And I'm sure we'll have you on the podcast again soon. Talk to you later. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.